So uh, this is a theoretical presentation and uh, I'm presenting concepts from a general theory of love which is a book by three psychiatrists who combined their research and came up with what um, they pr actually present as a general theory of love. And then I'm going to take their concepts and extrapolate to group worship. I've always thought that spiritual traditions endure for a reason. And I've always had in the back of my mind, a, what is a biological substrate of spiritual traditions, of religious practices? And then when I read uh, General Theory of Love, I had a prism through which to um, view some of these practices. So the biological substrate of religious practices is one of my thematic preoccupations and has been for several years. I'm sure many people here can identify with thematic preoccupations. <laughs> so, um, I'll go through this quickly for those of you who are not in the discipline of psychology for our students here. This is uh, introductory psychology. The brain is commonly understood within our discipline to have three major components called the triune brain model. Uh, Dr. McLean came up with this in the early 70s. The hind brain, which is the oldest part of the brain, reptilian, think of a gecko. Think of the gecko in those commercials. <laughs> so the gecko has a hind brain, we have a hind brain. It's reptilian, that is basic functions, breathing, waking, sleeping. Next, mammals. Here, limbic brain, and I'm using the model that one of our uh, guest speakers used, a psychologist who works with um, soldiers with PTSD, and she actually goes through this model with them. Her name is Dr. Flickinger, and she works on the base just north of the city. So limbic, think of a toddler screaming. So that's our emotional self. And as you know, part of the entertainment of toddlers is that everything is this big in their world. They're passionate, they're wholehearted, everything is emotion. And the limbic brain is really what enables us as mammals to attach to our young, to mother them. Crocodiles, for example, do not have a limbic brain. And crocodile babies, the greatest danger is of being eaten by predators. And those predators are usually adult male crocodiles. So mammals don't have that problem because of the limbic brain. There is the attachment between the uh, mother and the infant. Next is the neocortex, which is our most recent brain. And we rather pridefully, I mean, this is usually what we think of when we think about our brain. It's cognition, think Dr. Spock. So that's the neocortex. Logic, reason, motor movement, language, abstraction. <coughs> so the uh, psychiatrists pose a problem in this triune brain, where does love reside? And I'm going to speed through, I'm not even going to touch their thorough scientific arguments, they're all there in the book. They say it's in the limbic brain, advanced m emotionality. This is where love attachment resides biologically. It's the seat, the part of the brain that enables a mother to attach to an infant. And think of it, as the group of us were there fiddling with the computer, calling for help. <laughs> <laughs> what did you imagine was going on inside our minds and our hearts? Like you were looking at our faces, you could see the concern. I mean, this is your limbic brain at work. You know what is going on inside of us, or you have a sense of it. And we do this all the time. We decode complex messages instantly. That's our limbic brain. It is an instant cryptographic device. We use it all the time to get along with each other, to be in conflict with each other. So, love resides in the limbic brain. Now, there are actually physiological aspects of the emotional bond. And if there's anything I would like you to retain from this talk, it is 
Relationships are somatic. It's not just emotion. We have a physical impact on each other through our emotional bond. So the psychiatrists identify three aspects of this emotional bond, three physiological or biological substrates to this emotional bond. Limbic resonance. So it's, it's when, have you ever felt, oh, that person really gets me, really knows where I'm coming from. He really gets me. She really gets me. Yeah, I'm really in, in tune. I found a soulmate. That's limbic resonance, this sense that somebody else really catches the essence of who we are. And when we're trying to understand another person, we're, we're using our limbic brain to, um, to do that. So we tune into each other's emotional states. We use eye contact, we use facial expressions. Our facial muscles are attached directly to the skin and there's a myriad of muscles there. So we get information about other people's internal states, but think also, if there were a fire alarm and all the Concordia people here looked really panicked, that would give information to the outsiders about the level of threat in the external environment. So our limbic brain is a marvelous device for reading not only the internal state of other people, but giving us, a very in, giving us an instantaneous picture of the level of threat in the outside environment or the level of safety. I mean, you see a toddler, there's a loud noise. First thing the toddler does, looks at the mother's face. Is this a problem or, you know, is it a firecracker? And, and so the mother's face gives instant information about the external environment. And as you can imagine, this is very useful in terms of our adaptability and the survival of the species. The toddler doesn't need a neocortex to figure out whether or not to stop. He just can look at the mother's face. And in the same way, uh, we do that with each other. I mean, how serious is this situation? We check each other's faces. So limbic regulation is once this connection is set up, we actually regulate each other. People may be aware that women can synchronize their menstrual cycles. The research shows it's not just women who live together, it's women who have a strong emotional attachment and are not necessarily living together. So we have a number of biological processes that are actually modulated by other people and we modulate theirs. Think about what happens when you get in the door and your spouse or your partner or your child has a welcoming, delighted expression on their face. Well, that's one reaction. Or if they look angry or upset, that's another reaction. Or if your boss looks angry and upset, there's an immediate response and our response in turn affects the other person. So once this resonance is set up, we actually depend on each other to synchronize and to stay stable. So our physiology is partly open loop, and this is very counterculture in North America. We think we're all individuals. There's some kind of iron curtain between us and other people except you know our words or maybe our appearance well actually that's not so we regulate physiological processes breathing heart rate hormones relationships are somatic uh, and affiliation with caring people stabilizes us so it's not just children who need caring relationships to stay healthy we as adults need that too limbic revision I'll just mention it this is the power of new relationships to remodel existing patterns in the limbic brain. And this is really the basis upon which psychotherapy is effective. We now have the uh, MRIs to demonstrate that psychotherapy actually does change brain function. So repetition of new ways of relating through psychotherapeutic interaction has been demonstrated to have an impact on the uh, limbic brain. So limbic regulation, we have an open loop, physiology, uh, relationships affect participants physically, the somatic effects are reciprocal. So the implication is that adult emotional balance depends on, not just it would be nice to have, but depends on 
finding caring people who regulate you well and staying close to them. So, if you do not have enough of those people when you leave today, go out and find them <laughs> and stay close to them. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's mammals, you know, pets can work too. <laughs> So uh, I'll just refer briefly to David Meyer's talk when he said the beneficial effects of religious involvement was possibly 50% due to social support. This actually buttresses that argument that in fact we are physically dependent uh, on good relationships with caring people in order to have that safety margin of, uh, of adaptability. And I'll read this from uh, the book, Consider This, from the dawn of human species until just a few hundred years ago. Most human beings lived out their lives in one community. So the suggestion is that this is adaptive. We are social creatures and that our physical and emotional health depends on finding caring people who regulate us well and staying close to them. So. Moving on to group worship, I'm taking a, a both and approach here that group worship is both physiological, emotional, and spiritual. From the discipline of psychology, I cannot comment scientifically on Christ's message of compassion, and <coughs> I'm taking a both and approach. There is a spiritual dimension. I'm addressing a complementary dimension, which is the psychological, physiological. So, at the very least, we'd expect group religious practices to be consistent with what we know about brain function, attachment, and love. Traditions that endure for centuries, we wouldn't expect them to violate what is understood about uh, human relationships. So group worship, some commonalities, choral voice, song, speech, and choral movement. Moving is one. Uh, we'll move to choral voice. Do you find it easier to stay in tune while you're singing a hymn, when there's a good singer behind you? I know I kind of listen for the good singer and then I modulate my, my, uh, my, my frequency, my pattern, and my, my pitch to the good singer. My pitch can wander a bit. I like to think of myself as a good singer, but I cannot reliably uh, sing true to the notes. So I like to find someone. So think of all the harmonizing just in terms of breathing rate, patterning, pitch, loudness. I mean, you want to participate, but you don't want to launch into a solo. So you need to have your, you know, your voice kind of at the right level there. So you need to be uh, highly attuned for that harmony, harmonizing uh, speech, uh, pitch and loudness. Choral speech, there's prayers, there's spoken responses <coughs> to the worship leader. Sometimes a congregation will read a whole passage aloud. Choral movement. My background is Catholic, so I know all about choral movement. Stand up, sit down, genuflect, sign of the cross. Lots of choral movement in that tradition. Stand, kneel, bow your heads in prayer. Hands steepled in prayer, sign of the cross. This is not my background, but I understand some backgrounds. You wave hands to sing. Catholics are a bit too solemn to do that unless you're in the evangelical branch. So, choral movement. There's also uh, some suggestion that there are mirror neurons when we see people move. That is, it activates neurons in our brains that makes us want to move. So, it's not only the songs, the spoken prayers and responses, standing, sitting, and so on, but think also it's the rhythm in the silences at the end of a note. 
it's the rhythm after everyone stands up. There's kind of a rustling, and then there's a stillness. So we coordinate the pauses and silences as well. Movements have a beginning, middle, and ending. And think also before the sermon, people sit down. There's kind of a rustling, and the pastor knows just to wait. And it's almost like a musical beat. There's a settling, and then the pastor begins uh, with a sermon. Think also of breath. Breath is a powerful regulator. You know the Christmas carol where there's a lot of alleluias, and at the end you're out of breath, and then at the end of that phrase, the whole congregation <laughs> takes in a breath. Well, breath is a powerful regulator. It's the beginning, the end of a musical phrase, the beginning, the end of a verse and a sentence. Another aspect of group worship is the repetition. This is essential for a limbic learning. It's how patterns get consolidated in our limbic brains. Think of the comfort of a familiar hymn. I know I like it when there's a hymn I really like that comes up in, in the series. One of my favorites that I've sung for years. You know, there's a comfort in that. There's a, a joyousness. The repetition consolidates those patterns. Repetition of movement. At an opening convocation, I remember Gary Dombrowski did the sign of the cross, and I was in the front row. Well, as a Catholic, I automatically did the sign, and I was the only one because he had activated my limbic uh, learning for, for, for movement. So I was outed as a Catholic. <laughs> Oh, so my conclusion, uh, the choral voice and choral movement so evident in Christian services may facilitate the process of limbic regulation, suggesting that these group worship practices have their roots not only in the wisdom tr of tradition, but also in, importance, in important psychological pr principles which are shown to underlie the experience of love. Thank you very much.